Over 2,300 years ago, Aristotle described species as forming a scale or ladder of life, which distinguished higher from lower forms. During the European Dark Ages, Greek ideas were perpetuated through the work of Islamic scholars, and by the 12th century, their ideas were molded by Christian European scholars into a theistic chain of life, where humans ranked below angels, linked just below God, while wild animals ranked above domesticated ones for their spiritedness, and snakes worked at the dirt at the frontiers of hell. Such a ranking system was not particularly humbling for humans. Species had a divinely defined place in nature's hierarchy, and upward mobility was not an option. This Greco-medieval Christian worldview forms the basis of creationists' beliefs today. During the 1600s and 1700s, numerous European scholars argued that species had developed from common ancestors, and chief among them was the great French naturalist Georges-Louis Leclerc, eventually becoming Count of Buffon. He argued in the late 1700s that the diversity of species within individual kinds were groups of obviously related species such as lions, tigers, and domesticated cats, had likely descended from common ancestors. He also understood the evolutionary significance of vestigial organs and enjoined others of his day discussing the idea that apes and humans were somehow related. Near the turn of the 19th century, Erasmus Darwin went so far as to write, quote, that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament, unquote, which clearly laid further groundwork for his grandson Charles's arguments published over half a century later. By the early 19th century, evolutionary ideas were searching for a mechanism. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck vaguely described two forces, one that had diversified life and another that adapted life to its environment. But having inherited a worldview tainted by the great chain of life, he argued that species went through a natural development progression over time, and as part of this progression, Traits that an individual acquired during his or her lifetime were passed on to the next generation, something that has since then been shown to be false. Scientists started to take the idea of evolution seriously only after publication of Charles Darwin's book On the Origin of Species in 1859. Darwin was goaded into publication by Alfred Russell Wallace, who had independently discovered the all-important evolutionary mechanism of natural selection through field observations of his own in the islands between Australia and Southeast Asia. In Wallace's own words, quote, what was lacking in these speculations of these earlier writers, and the reason why they were not as widely read as Darwin, was that they failed to produce a motive power sufficient to cause the transformation of species, unquote. In short order, the accumulated knowledge of the past was resorted, much was discarded, former experts were discredited, a fresh research agenda was established, and biological science has not been the same since. And neither has how we view our place in nature. As stated earlier, the ideas that humans were related to other species, particularly primates, was not new, but highly vocal opponents of the idea marched in step with public opinion. Chief among these was anatomist and creationist Richard Owen, who apart from giving us the word dinosauria, and helping found the British Museum of Natural History, argued from false evidence that non-human primate brains were radically different from ours, so we could not be related as alleged. T. H. Huxley, the man who gave us the word agnostic, who was an outspoken Darwin supporter and early elaborator of human evolution, provided firm evidence that Owen was simply wrong. During the mid-20th century, the modern evolutionary synthesis largely supports Darwin's basic arguments, while invigorating his shortcomings with a radical new science. Our place in nature is extolled by an ever-growing inventory of past life recorded by fossils the world over, and today, genetic insights alone provide irrefutable evidence that you and every other form of life, whether plant or animal, share a long kinship on planet Earth. It is now common knowledge that we humans are members of one vast and ever shape-shifting family of life. To end this section, I quote John Mason, author of the popular 1923 Little Blue Book, Evolution Made Plain. Those who feel a sense of shame 
for their close proximity to their cousin, the monkey, are advised to increase that distance by carrying to higher development those traits considered peculiarly human. Reason, a sense of justice, of broader sympathy, and tolerance. It has taken centuries for science to wear away our arrogant assumptions of centrality. Science unwittingly achieved this by discovering that we are not at the center of the universe. Science has also woven precariousness and uncertainty into the fabric of our existence by showing that extinction is probable. For we are not particularly unique, either anatomically or genetically, but instead are kin to every living thing that we know exists and ever has existed. In many ways, this latter discovery has been the most difficult for us to come to terms with. It certainly has been for many religious institutions and non-scientists. For those of us with courage and calloused curiosity, science has endowed us with the greatest humility of all.